the path to the promised land happens to be a path that goes through the desert. <laughs> it's not a, it isn't a path that goes around the desert. It's, it's not a path that takes you right up, you know, to the coast of Alexandria where you hop on your cruise ship again, and you can just start floating around the Mediterranean for all, for all eternity. It is a path that goes through the desert. Yeah, in the Catechism, um, <laughs> which is a great uh, resource, by the way, it, just before paragraph 407 in, in a Catechism are the words, a hard battle, a hard battle. It's talking about our war against sin. Welcome to another inscrutable episode of On the Journey with Matt and Ken and Kenny. We are at the end of a series we've been doing on what it means to kind of live the Christian life, grow in holiness, be conformed to Christ. And if you want to go back and check out those other episodes that we've done to get us to this point, please do go to chnetwork.org and you can find them all there, the On the Journey series. Uh, you can also uh, join our online community, which is community.chnetwork.org. And if you want to be a supporter of this work so that we can continue to do things like this and other great series, uh, you can go to chnetwork.org slash compass. And uh, during the course of this series, if you go to that website and you put in the code OTJ3141, we will send you a copy of Marcus Grody's book, What Must I Do to Be Saved? Uh, Ken Hensley, Kenny Burchard, I've been trying to figure out what I should have gone back and done during the course of this series is emphasize a different word every time I brought this book out. Like, what must I do mm. to be saved? Or what must uh, I do to be saved? Or what, what must, must I, I do? Or what must I do to be saved? Or what must I do? But uh, but I never said you stole money. So I didn't go there. Yeah. But, Ken Hensley, can you be sure you ready to, <laughs> to wrap this series up on uh, well, like sanctification say, and, and all of that? Yeah. First of all, I don't think you want to do one where you emphasize the word to. The preposition, it doesn't add much. But secondly, I think that your uh, adjective today was my favorite in two years. Inscrutable? In a, yeah, an inscrutable episode. You know, an episode that you just basically can't figure it out. Mm. Who can, <laughs> which uh, means Catholic not, word. Who can know the depths? Which would mean it's not worth watching or listening to. No, it's not. It's, I mean, it's, it can be slightly scrutable. I mean, semi-scrutable. Slightly maybe. inscrutable? Inscrutable? Okay. You know, it's not like right. completely scrutable, but it's a little bit scrutable. Okay. Let us launch because we've got a lot to do today. We've got a lot of ground to cover. We've been addressing, as Matt said, as you, Matt, said just a moment ago, we've been addressing the Catholic doctrine of sanctification. And in short, sanctification, we all understand, is, the, is about the process by which we are transformed from the inside remolded into the image of Jesus Christ. In terms of our character, we become like Jesus. That's what sanctification is about. And we know that this is God's work of grace within us. We, we understand that. We approach it understanding only God can transform us from the inside by his spirit, by his grace, and make us different people. And Therefore, the process of sanctification is to some degree passive, meaning simply that God uses everything in our lives to transform us, to sanctify us, to make us more like Christ. And so a great deal of the work of sanctification is passive work in our lives. But that doesn't mean that we don't have uh, anything to do. That doesn't mean that we have no part in the process. And we've talked about this a number of times. If we had no part in the process, then what in the world would a biblical passage like Hebrews 12, 14 mean? where we read, strive for peace with all men and for the holiness. In other words, strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. If sanctification was purely and entirely a passive work, you know, I just lay down in my hammock and God just does it or does it while I'm sleeping, then that passage would have no meaning. The same with Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, where St. Paul writes, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He's telling us that there are things to do. There's something to do. 
work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Okay, so we start there. It's a passive work. It's an active work, this work of sanctification. Okay, in today's episode, what we're going to do, guys, is we're going to wrap up the entire series, which means summarizing where we've come over the previous seven episodes, and then focusing on one final, very important, crucial New Testament teaching near the end. Okay, and this will be broken down into two parts. First of all, I want to go over the theological context that we set forth in the first uh, three, I think, episodes um, of this series titled Turning from Idols to Serve the Living God. Go, okay, so first, theological context. And I think I'm going to run through this in about five points or something, but I just want the theological context, those listening, those watching, to really sink in that there's a logic, there's a biblical theological logic behind what we're talking about. And and this is where we began in this series. Every person seeks happiness. There's a place to begin. Here's how the Catholic philosopher Blaise Pascal put this. All men seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. This is the motive of every action of every man, even of those who hang themselves. And I want you to notice, Pascal says, whatever different means you and I may employ, we all tend toward this end. That is the desire for happiness. Okay, whatever different means, in other words, while happiness is our goal, each of us is always using some or many different means for getting there. We're always trusting in something. We're always trusting in something or someone to get us there. It may be money for someone. It may be the things that money can buy. It may be adventures. It may be uh, experiences. It may be power. It may be ambition. It may be sexual gratification. The bottom line is, and this is the point that I want to come out from this, everyone is living by faith. That, that's the bottom line point to start with. We're all seeking happiness and we're all living by faith in the sense that we're always trusting in something or someone. Are you with me, gentlemen? I'm Absolutely. with you. I'm with you. I mean, this okay. is, this is, I was just having this conversation with my son last night. We were talking about, you know, various things that, uh, that mm -hmm. might tempt, for instance, someone who is an 11 year old, right. Or, or various mm -hmm. things going on in his world and, you know, relating it to things going on in my world, relating it to things going on in the headlines that, you know, when we talk about people who are making terrible decisions, we don't talk about them as though they are terrible people doing terrible things for terrible reasons. <laughs> like all the people mm -hmm. in your mm -hmm. world who are doing anything are doing it all for the same reason, because they think it's going to p produce a positive result in their life, or it's going to give them something that they want. Right. I don't ever, right. I don't, I don't buy into the stuff that's part of the modern political discourse. Like this person is, you know, doing this platform, you know, positing this platform or doing this thing or advancing this agenda because they want to destroy the world. Like, I don't think that that's usually right. why somebody is doing that. They might indeed destroy the world. It might be a bad idea, but my guess is most people who do things, even terrible, horrible things, are doing it because they think it's going to achieve something that they think yeah. will be a good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I agree. And I, I would say, guys, this is a, in some ways an intuitive lens through which you can can read um, the whole Bible, especially think of wisdom literature, Psalms and, and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, the wisdom sayings of the sages, right? Uh, they, their constant use of this idea of blessedness and how blessedness happens and how connected mm -hmm. um, the way we live in the world is to that sense of blessedness mm -hmm. and that there there are different ways that people are going in the world and those ways lead to particular places so the bible is mm -hmm. giving us a heck of a lot of information about how this need you're talking about ken to be to be happy to be fulfilled satisfied to have shalom blessedness whatever you want to call it how that happens for christians okay so Everyone seeks happiness, satisfaction, mm -hmm. fulfillment, and everyone lives by faith in the sense that everyone is trusting in something or someone to uh, lead them to the destination that they want, okay? 
Point two in our theological context is this. Because we've been created to be God's sons and daughters, that is in the image and likeness of God, that's what it means in biblical terms. Because you and I have been created to be God's sons and daughters, the happiness that we seek is a happiness that can only be found in fulfillment of God's creative design for us. Okay, to find what we're looking for, I say this in other words, we must become what we were created to be. So happiness is to be found in a restored relationship with God, our maker, and in becoming what God made us to be. That is the fulfillment of, our, of God's creative design for us, which means in, in practical terms that we must come to love the Lord, our God, with all our heart, all our mind, all our energy, all of our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. This is the path to eternal happiness. And I want you to notice the Catechism of the Catholic Church actually begins with this foundational truth under the heading, the desire for God. So it actually begins with this idea that we desire, but it, this is what it says. I'm reading paragraph 27 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The desire for God is written in the human heart because man is created by God and for God, and God never ceases to draw man to himself. Only in God will he find the truth and happiness he never stops searching for. So we all seek mm -hmm. happiness. Everyone is trusting in something. And because we've been made by God in his image and likeness, the, there's a bottom line truth. Only in God will we find, will anyone ever find the truth and the happiness that they never stop searching for. Yeah, Kenny? Uh, yeah. And, and I, you know, guys, I've been reading um, St. Augustine's Confessions again, trying to go a little deeper, uh, <laughs> you know, here during this mm -hmm. season of, mm -hmm. of my life. Maybe this series has inspired me. But there's a couple of quotes that fit right here, Ken, with what you're sharing. Uh, one at the end of uh, chapter 10, at the end of book two. Just at the end of that paragraph, Augustine says, I sank away from thee, and wandered, O oh my God, too much astray from thee, my stay, in these days of my youth, and I became to myself a barren land. And then in the next wow. chapter in book three, there's this little phrase, he says, within me was a famine of that inward food, thyself, my God. So this is Augustine, and mm -hmm. we have this sort of poetic translation. All of this is I'm, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. I can only find the satiation of my hunger in God. Oh, but I've been trying all these other ways to, to fill myself up. Yeah, and the thing that I would you know sort of add to that, I was looking around my, mm -hmm. my record shelf over here. I've got Loretta Lynn up here, but she's not probably the most important person that I could have. I, I have, a, I have the, uh, the soundtrack to Chariots of Fire somewhere up in this, in this area, the... Great soundtrack. Do, 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 great do, do, soundtrack. It's a great oh, soundtrack. Yeah. Uh, if you haven't seen the movie, it's about Eric Little, who's this uh, Christian man who's also a good runner. And <clears throat> which the, the reason I bring him up is because he's a guy who kind of had some things in perspective. Um, evangelical Christian, for lack of a better way of putting it, right? Uh, he understood that God makes us for ultimate pleasure in him, but he also gives us ways to kind of seek him and you know employ our talents and gifts in this world there's this great line that i feel like i heard it quoted all the time from the pulpit you know eric little mm -hmm. saying you know god made me fast and when i run i feel his pleasure right, right? and right. so there's this sense in which god did give us the things of this world um you know to to point to him to seek after him to 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 live in excellence mm -hmm. right um there is some sort of a fleeting joy that we can get in enjoying aspects of his creation and doing good things because of the gifts that he has given us. But those are meant not to be, you know, siloed out unto themselves, uh, right? Eric Little, if he had just taken running and made that his God, he probably would have been miserable, <laughs> right? But because he contextualized it and put it in the context of a good God and as a foreshadowing of kind of what it would be like to live fully in the joy and presence of that God, like that's kind of what put it all in the right order for a guy like him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the other main fellow in that movie kind of did make running to win his God and was miserable. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. that's, a, that's an interesting... Okay, let me push it forward. Point three is this. Whatever we trust as a means to our happiness... 
this is what we will very naturally follow, love, and obey. Okay, so th this is personal. This is about the three of us. This is not just about the people who are listening or watching. This is about everyone in the world. We all seek happiness. We're all trusting in something to bring us that happiness because we've been made by God and God is calling us to himself. Only in God will we find it. And then the third truth that I want to emphasize here is whatever we are trusting, this is what we very naturally will follow and love and obey. And it's no wonder then that when we think about the call of the gospel, the call of the gospel, as we read it, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the other letters of the New Testament, it is not merely, it's never merely the call to believe some series of truths about Christ. You know, if you believe that he lived and he died and he ro ro rose again from the dead, you know, you accept these uh, facts, you know, you believe these things, you're a Christian. Uh, in fact, the call of the gospel is not even, cannot even be uh, reduced to accept Christ as personal Savior, but rather you read the gospels and the call is all-encompassing. It's to trust in Christ, to follow Christ, to love Christ, to obey Christ. In fact, as the Catechism says, I love this passage on faith, by faith, man completely submits his intellect and his will to God. With his whole being, man gives assent, gives his assent to God the Revealer. Sacred Scripture calls this human response to God the author of Revelation, the obedience of faith. And, and, mm -hmm. and then very quickly, in his introduction to Christianity, Joseph Ratzinger, the late Pope Benedict XVI, he described faith like this, and I love it. Quote, the phrase I believe could here be literally translated, I hand myself over to. Okay, so again, we're building a, we're building a bit of theology here, you guys. And it starts with, we all seek happiness and we all trust in something. There's always some means to getting there. Secondly, we've been made by God. Therefore, only in God will we find the truth and happiness we never stop searching for. And then point three is this. It turns out that whatever we are trusting, this is what we naturally follow, what we naturally love, what we naturally obey. So no wonder the call of the gospel is not simply believe these facts or, oh, accept Jesus as Savior. The call of the gospel ends up being Turn from what you've been trusting, whatever it is you've been trusting, and put your trust in me. Put your trust in Jesus. Love Jesus. Follow Jesus. Obey Jesus. That's point three. So I'm thinking back to when I was trying to cross something off of my bucket list, and that was to run a half marathon. <clears throat> and I got involved in this kind of running club in my area. And they met a few different times. One of the times they met was on Sunday mornings, early on Sunday mornings. And I would go to like a little bit of a later mass. I'd go out and run. And then go with this group. I think I was like the only person in that group. Maybe there's like one other evangelical in the group that went to church. Uh, but what we would do is we'd go and we'd we'd run, and people would be talking about running. They'd be talking about their experience of running. They'd be sharing, you know, the uh, the memories of the races that they had, the struggles that they had with running, you know, and their injuries and and all this. It was just running, running, running. And I thought to myself, like, this is. Uh, this is a place where people are investing their time, investing their money, investing their emotional energy, building a community around this thing. I'm like, this is like, this is like, in some ways, kind of like a religion, right? We even meet on Sunday mornings for a couple of hours, right? Uh, but I, I think that there are a lot of people who are under the impression that they're not religious or the um, under, under the impression that they don't have anything that serves as like a God in their life. But really, whatever you give the most of your time to, whatever you give the most of your energy to, whatever you give the most of your money to, I mean, that's the thing that you've decided is the most important thing in your life. And there are plenty of us who give lip service to the fact that, or to the idea that God is the most important thing in our life, and yet all our actual time and energy is wrapped up in some other thing, right? Uh, we, yeah. we prioritize these other things. Uh, it's it's an easy thing to give lip service to, to say that you believe all this stuff and then turn around mm -hmm. and spend all your time and energy on like your favorite NFL team, <laughs> right? Or something else. Mm -hmm. Everyone's living by faith, as we said. Everyone has a God. Yeah, Kenny, I hear you revving up yeah. to say something. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> say something. <laughs> you know, and, and I to, to tie into that, I, I think this attempt to separate or dislocate 
faith and obedience from belief. Like they're two different things. That just, that is a late innovation. That is not um, an intuitive biblical way of thinking because you have all of these rhetorical questions and scenarios set up by the biblical authors, including, you know, Jesus himself saying, how can you call me Lord and not do the things that I say? Or Paul saying, you, you know, you don't walk worthy of the calling. Or James saying, how can you say you have faith and not, and not back that up with a life? So it just isn't the biblical way of thinking. It isn't, yes, if, if I can say it this way, it's not Christianity to dislocate faith and obedience from each other. And um, yeah, that's those two things are inseparable. They, they are, in a sense, the same thing. Faith is obedience to God, or like you said, Ken, to whatever has control over your life. You know, there's a paraphrase in my mind. I, I wish I could remember the exact quote, but Fulton Sheen says something that, that to the effect of, if you don't live the way that you believe, you'll end up believing the way that you live, <laughs> right? <laughs> Essentially, whatever so it is good. that, I mean, yeah. if you don't live the things that you say you believe, you're going to end up, well, it's essentially like a, a distillation of lex serandi, lex credendi, like right, the law of prayer is the law of, the, of yeah. belief. The, the things that you do tell you what you believe. So. Okay, then within this context that is being built here, here's point four in our summarization of the theological foundations, really, of, of this series we've been doing. It's this. The essence of, of our sin, then, is that we turn from God to seek our happiness elsewhere. In other words, in idols. Sin mm -hmm. is spiritual idolatry. If we're seeking happiness, and we are, if we can only find it in God, and, and, we, and, we, and, and we can only find it in God, if the thing we trust, we always follow and obey, and, and that's why the call of the gospel is to follow and obey Christ, the essence of our sin is to do the reverse then. The essence of our sin is to turn from God or to never come to God and to seek our happiness elsewhere in some created thing, some person. In other words, in some idol. Sin is spiritual idolatry. This is something we've developed. Sin is spiritual idolatry. Now, why is that sin? Well, it, it's sin because when we do this, it, it's about implications. We imply that God is not worthy of our highest love. We dishonor God. Uh, St. Paul put it like this in Romans chapter 1, verses 21 and 23, or through 23, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him but they became futile in their thinking, and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man or birds or animals or reptiles. Okay, now he's talking about literal idolatry in the pagan world here, but I'm kind of bouncing off that, you guys, uh, you know, an analogically, and I'm just saying, mm -hmm. this is what it means. You know, if I decide okay, so I'm made in the image of God. Okay, God is calling me all day long. Only in God will I find my truth and happiness. But what I really believe is that I need to get a lot of money and I need to buy these really nice things. And that's going to be the, the secret to my happiness. When I do that, I'm committing spiritual idolatry and I'm dishonoring God because the implication is, you know, uh, that, you know, many, many tekel you farsen, that God, I've, you know, I've put you in the balances and you've been found wanting, you know, from Daniel chapter mm -hmm. five, uh, the story of Belshazzar. That's, it, that, that's what's implied. If I make an idol out of anything in this created universe, I'm implying that God is not worthy of my greatest love. That's why we can describe sin as spiritual idolatry. This is another good place for an Augustine quote, I think. Uh, he yeah, says, it just, it, 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 I love it. Uh, yeah. thus he says, thus doth the soul commit fornication when she turns from thee seeking without thee. And then later in that paragraph, he says, behold, mm -hmm. thy servant fleeing from his Lord and obtaining a shadow. O rottenness, O monstrous life, O depth of death. So he's basically saying the same thing. I'm, I'm wow. chasing all of these things that just seem like the right thing, but I grab them and it's a shadow. I eat it, it's death. I wrap my arms around it, it disappears. 
And that's what the cycle of sin feels like in anyone's life who's being honest. Yeah, there's uh, the concept, uh, you know, if you if you dig into like the concept of sin, you know, sometimes uh, you hear it described as going astray or missing the mark. Uh, and I think we can have have sort of like a domesticated idea of sin because if we say, oh, well, I missed the mark again, like I shot yeah. at the at the bullseye and I, you know, ended up in the red ring instead. Uh, and I think we like I said, we have such this domesticated idea of sin. It's like, oh, well, you know, uh, but, you know, if you think about it in sort of bigger terms, like more cosmic, like eternal terms, like what happens if you're on an Apollo mission returning from the moon headed back to Earth? and you miss like i feel like that's a bigger kind of way to miss the mark right than just oh i was aiming for the bullseye and i got a a wider ring you know this this aiming and missing thing i think also goes back to this idea from that first uh step in this is is seeking happiness but seeking it in something i mean the the everybody our desires for happiness right our desires for whether it's sex or money or food or any of these other things are all properly contextualized good things like you would and i wouldn't be here if there was not a proper context for sex right we would not be able to do anything in this world if there was not a proper context for money um i would be you know a bag of bones on the side of the road if there was not a proper context for desire for food but again when you when you go after those things in a way that misses the mark of what the proper Mm -hmm. desire is is built for then then you go astray Yes, and the things you've just said, Matt, and it, and and then the 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 quotations, Kenny, that that you just took from Augustine, basically summarizes point five. Now we're moving to point five, which is not only does our spiritual idolatry dishonor God, because it implies that He is not worthy, it also leaves us empty, dissatisfied, unhappy. And and you're right, Matt. This world is filled with good things. God created the world. He looked at it and said, "Is very good." These are all good things, and I think you use the word context, when appreciated, when used within their proper context, but it's not the proper context to make any one of them into God, and to make uh, to make any one of these created things into an idol, and to say, my search for happiness will be fulfilled in you. This dishonors God, and then point five is, it also leaves us dissatisfied, empty, unhappy. And I just want to hear, a, let us just hear a few quotations on this um, because they're so powerful. Kenny just read from, from Augustine, great quotations. Well, here's Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, where God through the prophet says, be appalled, O heavens, at this, be shocked, be utterly desolate, says the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and they've dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. There it is. Two sins. We've sinned against God because we've implied that he's not the greatest. You know, you know, they've forsaken me, the spring of living water. We've turned from God to our idol. And we've dug these cisterns, these broken cisterns that cannot hold water. They don't satisfy anyway. Here's C.S. Lewis from his uh, famous sermon, The Weight of Glory. Here we are fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Here's how Pascal put it. There was once in man a true happiness, of which there now remained to him only the mark and empty trace which he in vain tries to fill from all his surroundings. But these are all inadequate because the infinite abyss within us can only be filled by an infinite and immutable object, that is to say, by God himself. You cannot find a wise Christian in the history of the world who has not understood this and hasn't talked about it. And let me read one more quotation from the the great Thomas Merton, and then I'd like to hear your comments on this. From his book on, on the theology of St. John of the Cross, The Ascent to Truth, this book right here, it's a fantastic book if you want to read it. This is what he says. The earthly desires of men, the earthly desires men cherish are shadows. I think you used that word, Kenny, from, from Augustine. There is no true happiness in fulfilling them. Why, then, do we continue to pursue joys without substance? 
because the pursuit itself has become our only substitute for joy, the pursuit. Unable to rest in anything we achieve, we determine to forget our discontent in a ceaseless quest for new satisfactions. It is not enough to say that the man who has attached, who is attached to this world, it's not enough to say that he's bound himself to this world once and for all by a wrong choice, like some single wrong choice he made on a, on a particular day. No, he spends a whole net of falsities around his spirit by the repeated consecration of his whole self to values that do not exist. He exhausts himself in the pursuit of mirages that ever fade and are renewed as fast as they have faded, drawing him further and further into the wilderness where he must die of thirst. I think this paints the, yeah. these five points we've made pretty beautifully. You know, I'm thinking of, of a Catholic word right here. <laughs> well, two, actually. What? what, what uh, the? The, the, the? The. No. Uh, well, these are, these are, and this word is something that people, they recoil at, but it's the word mm -hmm. order or disorder. Um, ordered and disordered. And we, when we as Catholics talk about th these two words, we talk about things as being ordered to, like A is ordered to B, or mm -hmm. one is ordered to two, like things go together in particular ways. This is the Catholic idea of order or ordered. And when we try to put things together in ways that they don't, where, where they don't conscribe to God's created intentions, mm -hmm. We are disordering our lives. We're working against God, the creator, and his creative intentions for us. So we feel, you know, we begin disordered. to feel <laughs> disordered and, and, yeah. and dissonance within ourselves. Um, and if we, if we push too hard against that, that natural inclination to resist something that's disordered, mm -hmm. then we become numb to it over time. And then it begins to feel natural and we lose our sensitivity. The book of Romans talks about what can happen to our minds uh, when, when we do this over and over again. Um, and so, yeah, if, if we live a life that is not ordered to God and inside of creation, we're interacting with things in ways that aren't ordered to how those things <laughs> Are supposed to be, mm -hmm. then our lives become a mess. Yeah, on this point uh, that you make, I mean, to, to summarize point five again, not only does our spiritual idolatry dishonor God, it also leaves us empty, dissatisfied, and unhappy. Um, I love that quote that you have from Merton on John of the Cross, where it says, why do we continue to pursue joys without substance? Because the pursuit itself has become our substitute for joy. So we're all dads here. Um, Ken, you also have like several dozen grandchildren, uh, but we've all been children <laughs> ourselves. Uh, so I guess my question is, is there anything like the materialist hangover when you open the last Christmas present? Like, is, have you have you hung out with a kid when they open that last Christmas present and then they're like looking under the tree because there's not another one? And they're like, it's just like depression sets in at about two o'clock on Christmas Day. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like... Yeah. Is that it? Is that all? I got the things that I thought that I wanted. There's not more. Like, is this all? There's not. And then it's the next And then it's the next check thing. Check the garage. Like, check the attic. Yeah, like, Easter, there's not. Easter's coming. And then vacation's coming. And then Halloween's coming. You know, this is yeah. the, the next thing. What does he say about the pursuit? Becomes right. It's the pursuit. Yeah. Or like, what's worse? One of the worst things in the world is yeah. like, it's 4 p.m. On, on Christmas Day and your kid's like, I'm bored. I'm like, you just got like uh -huh. all these things, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, Can't one yeah, of them, yeah. you know, do something. But it's that materialist hangover. And it's, I mean, I'm not saying that all my kid, you know, all our kids are, are idolaters or anything. But, like, it is. It's part of this thing where you're like, you thought that the opening all those things on Christmas morning guess, was going to make you happy. And then it's like, yeah, it's yeah I like guess emptiest. I guess maybe it would be good to emphasize again that this created world is very good and there there are very good things in this created world i i receive yes. a lot of joy from my several dozen <laughs> grandchildren no th th that's a little high, high on the number but anyway you know there is real joy to be had in all of the good things that god has created for us but again it's that word context you know used and enjoyed within their proper context but if you try to make any one of those things that that thing that's going to solve your 
desire for unhappiness. Again, as Pascal said, he goes, all these are inadequate because the infinite abyss. And I remember one of my professors at seminary, he used to stress that. He'd say, he goes, the abyss within me is infinite. He goes, it is so deep. He goes, it cannot be filled. It won't be fulfilled by anything in this world. I remember he referred to his wife as a, as a five foot two featherless biped. He says, do you think that she's going to fulfill this infinite abyss inside of me? So, hmm. but the reason we have this abyss that is, that is deeper than all of creation is because we are made by God and for God. I mean, for God, that's an important word. There's a cat. No, I was going to say Catholic word. I'm just joking. But for, <laughs> we're, we're made for God. Okay. But anyway, let me sum up here quickly. This is the theological context that they, that you and I developed in the first three episodes of this series on sanctification. And this is a description, I think very accurate description, of where the Lord finds us as fallen children of Adam and Eve. We're created for God and yet attached to idols of all kinds. Created for infinite happiness, wandering in a desert where we are about to die of thirst as we keep looking to one idol after another. Okay, this is where God meets us. Now, in episodes four through seven of this series, um, we turn to address the practical side. So what do we do? What can we do if this is where we're at? And, and we're all here to some extent, to one extent or another, unless we become completely sanctified already and we're ready just to sort of float straight up to heaven. You know, um, Okay, we looked at the story of the Exodus, gentlemen. The story of the Exodus, this is the story of how God delivered his people, Israel, from bondage, from their bondage in Egypt, as slaves in Egypt. And using the Exodus as our pattern, understanding that the story of the Exodus is a type that has its fulfillment, its antitype in the New Testament, we began to look at how God delivers each of us from our attachments to idols. And step one was this. Deliverance begins with prayer. Sounds so trite. Sounds so basic. This is how it happened for the Israelites. It was when the Israelites began to cry out to God in their bondage that God appears to Moses in the burning bush. And he says, and I'm quoting from Exodus, we have seen, or I have seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I have come down to deliver them. Okay, so using the story of the Exodus again, first step, deliverance in your life, deliverance in my life, deliverance from idols, begins when we cry out to God for deliverance. You know, you said such an important thing there to set this up. Like, you talked about the brokenness, the emptiness, the idolatry, and, and the dissatisfaction, the despair, and you said, this is where God finds us. Uh, I think that sometimes we flip it around and think this is where we find God, <laughs> right? Um, you know, we we joke, and I think we even joked in this series about how sometimes people who are in our world will say they read their way into the church as though I, as a, you yeah. know, in the in the heresy of Pelagianism, through my own act of will and good library choices, you know, discovered the <laughs> truth about God. Um, but the Catechism, and I've, I think I've read this in this series before, Catechism has such a great way of putting this. It's one of my favorite paragraphs in, in the whole Catechism. It's paragraph 2567. It says, God calls man first. Man may forget his creator or hide far from his face. He may run after idols or accuse the deity of having abandoned him. Yet the living and true God tirelessly calls each person to that mysterious encounter known as prayer. In prayer, the faithful God's initiative of love always comes first our own first step is always a response. Um, and I think that's just such an important point that this is where God finds us. And uh, yeah, often we think we're that, the one who found who found God, right? Um, that's even how that passage, the, we, it's commonly phrased is you found Jesus. No, yeah. well, it's kind of the other way around. Yeah. I was noting the fact that that passage included the word idols too. You know, it says yeah. when we've gone off after our idols. Okay, it begins with prayer. Deliverance begins with prayer. That's something we can do. In fact, in fact, I have to, I, I have to admit to myself that if I am not praying to be delivered from some something that has me attached in this world, then I must not care enough. 
um, it must be that it's still in the future when God will be able to say, I, I hear Ken crying out under his taskmaster and I've come down to deliver him. I must not be ready. I must not want it enough. It's a sort of like what they say in AA that until someone hits rock bottom, there's that phrase, then they're not going to change. They're not going to move forward. But deliverance begins with prayer. Step two is to trust God and to do whatever God is telling you to do. In other words, there must be obedience. Kenny, you brought that out, obedience and faith. They're just two sides of the same coin. Think about it. Noah had to trust God and he had to build the ark. Abraham had to trust God and he had to leave Ur of the Chaldees, his family, his kindred, and follow God. For the children of Israel under Moses, it was the Passover. They had to slaughter the lamb, smear the blood, eat the lamb, and walk out of Egypt. And so I guess the question for us is this, what is God calling me to do? I have some idol in my life. I have some um, disordered, to use the word that Kenny brought up, disordered uh, attachment, disordered affection in my life. I have some addiction, some bad habit, whatever you want to call it. What is God calling me to do with that? Mm -hmm. To trust him and to follow him. Yeah, Kenny? You, you know, on a pastoral level, one thing I think that it's important to remember is that with this process, there are things that are always the same and then there are things that are going to be unique to each person's circumstances. So what's always the same is that everybody who is on this path toward holiness and sanctification will have to do something, will have to obey the Lord. But we don't all struggle with the exact same sins. Um, we don't all have the same exact bondages, and we haven't all wandered down exactly the same you know, dark pathways. Uh, there are common things, that, things that are common to all of us. But with each person then, you know, following your, your process for sanctification here, or the, the Christian process for sanctification, each person then calling out to the Lord will need to do whatever God tells that person to do. We'll need to obey God. I just read a scripture right here, if, that, if that's okay, guys, It's uh, and, and it's in the New Testament, so uh, we know it counts, right? Uh, <laughs> so so um, in Peter's letter in, um, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, he says, therefore, prepare your minds for action, discipline yourselves, set all your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring you when he's revealed. Like obedient children, do not be conformed to the desire that you formerly had in ignorance. Instead, mm -hmm. as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct. And so everybody can take that text personally. Everybody can do a deep dive on their own life and say, well, what in the world is that going to mean for me? I'm going to have to obey God in some very specific ways. I was just going to say, Kenny and I came from the Wesleyan Arminian background, which is very heavy on cooperating with God's will and 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 uh, obedience of faith. Whereas you came from more of like a Calvinist background, we've talked a little bit about some of the distinctions. And all I would add to this conversation is that if you're not supposed to cooperate with God, why does the Bible tell you to do anything at all? Right, 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 <laughs> I mean, right. Yeah, and I like what you said, Kenny, a moment ago about for each person, it's going to be different. You know, uh, you know. Again, Noah had to build a boat. He has, God hasn't said anything to me about that. Abraham had to leave where he lived, and he had to go somewhere else. Moses and the children of Israel. You know, Naaman the Syrian had to go dip himself in the Jordan River seven times. The man born blind had to wash in the pool of Siloam. Zacchaeus had to come down out of a tree. You know, he, right. you know, what is it, God, for you? It, it might be you have to turn off the internet. Or it, it might be for some of you, you need to get blocking software on your phone, on your computer. What is God calling me to do? Okay, so deliverance for us begins with prayer. And then step two is to trust God, to listen to his voice, and to do what he's telling us to do, whatever it is. Okay, step three was this we brought out. This, this is a mental thing, if you will, a theological thing, but Step three is we need to fix our minds on a, an extremely important New Testament truth, and that is that in our baptism, viewed sacramentally, God acting through the water and the words, we were set free. At a fundamental level, 
the power of sin, Paul teaches us in Romans 6, was broken in our lives. We were given the ability to walk in newness of life, Paul says. In other words, we need to fix it in our minds that we do not have to serve idols because it's easy to say, no, I'm in bondage. I'm in slavery. I have to. There's nothing I can do. No. St. Paul tells us in our baptism, the power of sin deep within our hearts, deep within our souls at some level was broken and we are free. We are ready to walk free. Now, in the Israelite story, again, we're looking at the Exodus as our type the hard line for them between slavery and freedom was the crossing of the Red Sea. This is when Pharaoh and his armies were destroyed and they walked out the other side, free men and women living under God. Well, for, for you and for me, again, St. Paul tells us, it's the moment of our baptism when this hard line occurred. In fact, to describe it in the words of Ezekiel chapter 36, this is when God sprinkled clean water on us and we were cleansed from our impurities when God began to remove our hearts of stone and give us hearts of flesh, this is when God put his spirit within us to cause us, to motivate us, to walk in accordance with his statutes and laws. This is when something happened. And because of this, Paul says in Romans chapter 6, and I'm quoting him now, that we no longer have to serve sin. Mm -hmm. We no longer have to serve sin. So it begins with prayer. Step two, trusting God and acting. Step three, keeping it clear in our minds that we do not have to serve sin any longer. Yeah, there's this there's this um, idea that I, I have learned as a relatively new Catholic, uh, now uh, around four years as a Catholic, and that is this idea of uh, recalling or remembering my, my baptismal vows. Mm -hmm. And the church gives us a, a tool for doing this every time we enter and leave a church. We pass by the waters of baptism. And we've talked about this in other uh, series, but we pass by the waters of baptism. We touch them again with our hands. We place them again on our bodies in the sign of the cross, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And in a very uh, tangible way, we remind ourselves of the spiritual reality of what Paul says in Galatians, that if we've been baptized into Christ, we've put on Christ. There's actually a mark on our lives. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's something about remembering who you are, you know, like remembering what team you're on, remember the, remembering the vow that you, that you took. This is embedded in lots of things in culture that you recall these vows that you took or these oaths that you swore or these words that you said and those can give you strength <laughs> when there's when there's a time of of weakness so we're called you know as catholic christians yeah. to recall our baptism all the time uh, hundreds of times a year if you're if you're going to church i mean it's it's amazing yeah it is re really amazing and uh of course you know whenever you're at a baptism especially in adult baptism, the pastor will often turn to the congregation. The priest will, you know, then invite us all to, to go through and renew our baptismal vows as we're watching someone else take them for the first time. But what strikes me about the Catholic bap baptismal rite is once you get into the vow part of it, uh, it does not begin, do you, having studied and researched the Word of God and the Catechism, um, have you come to an intellectual assent that this is the true teaching of Jesus Christ and that this is his true church. No, it starts, do you reject Satan? <laughs> like, that's it. Like, that's how it starts, right? It basically, it breaks yes. that bond that you're talking about mm -hmm. that we have mm -hmm. to sin. I mean, in, and we may go back and do awful and terrible things. There's a long, long history of baptized Catholics doing it. There'll probably be plenty of baptized Catholics in hell for all I know. I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, I haven't been there and checked. But... I, I, there is some kind of I, fundamental break that the church is calling us to when it starts off the whole thing by saying, do you reject Satan? If so, we can get to this other stuff. And I like it that it begins there, Matt. Um, it's not something that I'm, you know, that, that was part of my life before I was a Catholic uh, in terms of baptism, starting with the re renunciation of Satan. But that really is what it is. It's like like Ken sets it up in this in this Exodus narrative of that's when you cross over. So of course that's where the baptismal vow begins. Are you leaving this land that you came from? 
uh, of slavery. Yes or no? Yeah, yes, I am. Okay, then you can go. You can do the next thing now. And then, so in this war against sin, you know, this pro- this process of sanctification, I'm often going to have to renew my baptismal vow. I, re- I renounce Satan. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, th- this is something I have to do regularly, but praise God, you know, we have a tool for this as Catholic followers of Jesus. It's amazing. And y- y- Yes, to remember what God has done in you, and a, a passage that just jumps out at this point is 1 Corinthians 10, 13, where Paul says, no temptation has come upon you except what is common to man and God is faithful he will not let you be tempted beyond what you were able but with the temptation will give you a way out I'm, I'm paraphrasing but he's saying mm-hmm. to Christian people that you don't have to fall you do not have to uh, give your will over to whatever the temptation is okay so the Israelites cried out to God it begins with prayer the Israelites obeyed God they trusted him they did what he told them to do in the Passover and they walked out of Egypt Three, they passed through the Red Sea and entered into a new life. And then fourth, they were led by the Spirit of God out into the desert to be tested and tried and changed in the process. And that's step four for us is to allow ourselves to be led by the Holy Spirit into a desert. Notice, I I didn't say, okay, allow ourselves to be led by the Holy Spirit onto a carnival cruise line you know, to, you know, go, you know, uh, go around, you know, the Mediterranean or something. It's to led by the spirit into the desert where we following the model of Israel in the desert, following the model of our Lord, who was driven out into the desert to be tempted immediately following his baptism. We are going to be tempted and tried. And here's the thing changed in the process. And I, I want to make a point here that came out really in our fellowship meeting today on the in the online community where a couple of people were talking about suffering and and I made the point there okay, put it like this there is no teacher like suffering or to, to say it another way you, you you and I we will never meet a truly tender-hearted man or woman who has not suffered you and I will never meet a truly holy man or woman who has not been tried in the fire of affliction and by the grace of God come out the other side. I mean, this is simply how things work. It, it simply is a fact that suffering is one of the primary tools in this world, in this life, that God uses to make us better people, to make us tenderhearted, to make us more, more gentle to make us more caring, to make us more sacrificially loving. And I, I want to just read a couple of verses that I gathered from the Bible that, that talk about this. Just, just listen to them. Here's Psalm 66, verses 10 through 12. For you, O Lord, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our backs. You have caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but you brought us out to rich fulfillment. Here's Psalm 119, verse 71. It was good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Here's Job, chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. How happy is the one whom God reproves. Therefore, do not despise the discipline of the Almighty, for he wounds, but he binds up. He strikes, but his hands heal. And then one more that we all have heard a lot of times. And like you said, Kenny, it's from the New Testament, so it counts. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 7 and 11, (laughs) where we read, It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom the Father does not discipline? For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. Later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. The path, this is the way I said it several times in these in past episodes, is simply to say that the path to the promised land happens to be a path that goes through the desert. <laughs> it's not a, it isn't a path that goes around the desert. It's, it's not a path that takes you right up, you know, to the coast of Alexandria where you hop on your cruise ship again and you can just start floating around the Mediterranean for all, for all eternity. It is a path that goes through 
the desert. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the Catechism, um, <laughs> which is a great uh, resource, by the way, it, just before paragraph 407 in, in a catechism are the words, a hard battle, a hard battle. And it's talking about our war against sin. And then down in, in paragraph 409, uh, quoting from Gaudium et Spes, I hope I said that right, guys, is this quote, the whole of man's history has been the story of dour combat with the mm. powers of evil, stretching, so our Lord tells us, from the very dawn of history until the last day, finding himself in the midst of the battlefield, man has to struggle to do what is right and is at great cost to himself and aided by God's grace that he succeeds in achieving his own in inner integrity. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you know, to add to the verses, uh, I'm going to, you know, one up you. You've been quoting from the Old Testament from Hebrews, but I'll quote our Lord in Matthew uh, 16, 24, when he says, if anybody <laughs> wants to come after me, you know, he must deny himself and take up his cross and, and follow me. Implied in that is that the Christian life, it's kind of in, built, baked into the cake, this idea of suffering. But even on the natural level, um, there's a sense in which we don't trust the authority of people who haven't undergone some kind of suffering, right? We don't trust the authority and witness of a politician who was born in a silver with a silver spoon in their mouth and never worked a day in their life, right? We, we don't trust people like that. Uh, you know, Tina Turner recently passed away, and I heard someone uh, make a comment like, she sang like a person who knew, who had known pain. And when you hear Tina Turner, you're like, this person, I feel like I can trust what she says about stuff because she's been through some things. Like she has like an authority in her voice that is born of yeah, um, yeah. the the things that she overcame um, in an abusive relationship and, and all the things that went along with that. Like when someone has a story of suffering and perseverance and endurance, and we're going to get into that here in just a little bit, there's a sense that there's some credibility that goes along with that. Um, yeah. That, and when you quote built into that suffering. And when you quote Jesus as saying, you know, you must take up your cross and follow me, or you cannot be my disciple, you must take up your cross. There, there are some versions of Christianity that, that have the idea in mind, Jesus took up his cross and he suffered and died so that we don't have to. And, uh, you know, in our life is more about, you know, uh, uh, you know, what's that, uh, you know, what's that one? Oh, the prosperity gospel, you know, you know. God wants me driving a Ferrari or whatever, you know, that, that kind of thing. But Catholicism, and not just Catholicism, there, there, there are versions of Protestantism that have this idea. But yes. what Catholicism teaches us is that, is that, no, it's not that Jesus takes up his cross and dies so that we don't have to. He takes up his cross and he dies to bring us the forgiveness of sins so that we then can take up our cross and follow in his steps and be molded into his image. So, our lives repeat his life in a way, not exactly, and not, not, you know, not exactly, but our lives, the basic trajectory of our life repeats his. We take up a cross, we follow, we suffer, we are transformed in the process. That's what the desert is all about. Yeah, and I just want to let, let people know, if you want to, I mean, the prosperity gospel sounds like it's this really cool, cushy way to live, but I've, I just finished recording an episode of Coming Home Network Presents with Lisa Cooper, who came up through the word of faith movement. And if you think that's mm -hmm. all sunshine and roses, a lot of it's a veneer. A lot of it is sort of the illusion that everything is great and nobody's allowed to talk about the very real suffering that everybody's experiencing because they're afraid by admitting suffering, they're admitting that they don't have real faith. Uh, I mean, you may think that that's right, a good right, cushy right. way to, to be, but uh, yeah, right. I, I, I would encourage people to hear Lisa Cooper's testimony um, when that episode releases here pretty soon because that's a very hollow and empty and disorienting and ultimately untruthful and unreal way to live. Okay, step five. There, there's, a, there's a lot in this episode, I know, and I, and I hope that some people will really bear with it, maybe even take notes, but there's a lot here. Uh, step five is this. We need to receive often and with thankful hearts, we need to receive the supernatural food and drink that God has given us for our journey through the wilderness of this life. This is step five. Okay. We cry out to God in prayer. We trust God and obey. 
baptized through the Red Sea. We receive our baptism and the change that that brings about. We follow the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, realizing that we will be tempted. We will be tried in the fires of affliction, and we will be changed in that process. And then along the way, what did God give the Israelites? He gave them manna from heaven. He gave them water from the rock. He gave them sustenance for their journey through the wilderness. He didn't just say, okay, I'm going to lead you through the wilderness and the desert and tough luck. He gave them mm. sustenance. Okay, now in a broad sense, I just want to add that you know God supplies us in all sorts of ways with, with water in the desert. I, I think of Isaiah 55 that begins, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters and drink. You who have you know no money, come by. Okay, I, I think of Jesus saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. I think of a passage like Isaiah 49, where God promises that his people, and I'm quoting it now, 49, 9, and 10, his people will feed beside the road and find pasture on every barren hill. They will neither hunger nor thirst, nor will the desert heat and sun beat upon them. He who has compassion on them will guide them and will lead them beside springs of water. Okay, so there, there are a number of ways, I'm just saying, that, that God cares for us while we live this life and we walk through the desert led by the Spirit of God. But in the story of the Exodus, there, there was something much more specific. They cried out, we are dying, we're hungry, we're thirsty. Why did you bring us out of here? Please let us go back to Egypt where at least we had something to eat. And God gave them manna from heaven, supernatural food. And he gave them supernatural water springing from the rock. And for you and I, the fulfillment of this is what St. Ignatius of Antioch referred to as the medicine of immortality. I'm talking about the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. That's step five, to receive it often, to receive it with thankful hearts. This is our supernatural food for the journey. Mm -hmm. You know, just popping into my mind are, are Jesus' words, uh, I am the vine and you are the branches and apart from me, you can do nothing. And as, as Catholic followers of Jesus, one of the ways that we actualize <laughs> and, and live out the truth of, of what Jesus says there is to go to communion. And we understand that communion is in the body of Jesus and with the body of Jesus. And in that sense, we're saying, and you're saying, part of our sanctification happens when we stay connected to the vine uh, of which we are the branches. And the way we connect to him as followers of Jesus is with this supernatural food, the eating and drinking and participation and koinonia in the body of Christ. It's not, it's not possible to stay uh, connected to Jesus without that medicine from heaven, this gift of this incredible meal that God has given us. Well, we've, we've mentioned baptism, which is one of the sacraments. And my point here is, yes, through, the sacraments are means of grace. They are means mm -hmm. of receiving God's own life infused into us. We've talked about baptism already. Now we're talking about the sacrament of the Eucharist, and we're going to move forward in just a second to talk about another sacrament. But I want to make sure that if Matt has something to say, say it. I've said it in the uh, entire series <laughs> that we did on the Eucharist, as well as the entire series we did on baptism. Uh, so I would encourage people to go back to that and maybe even go back to our entire series that we did on the Mass as well. So uh, yeah. Yeah. I'll refer people okay. back to those okay. rather than dive back into them here. Okay, well then, as we move forward in the story, we realize in the story of Israel, there's another sacrament that comes up, and that is the sacrament of confession. And so step six is we need to avail ourselves as much as needed of this other great means of grace, this other great channel of grace for receiving forgiveness, and that is the sacrament of confession. When the Israelites sinned, okay, they receive the manna, they receive the water, they're wandering through the desert. When they sinned, God gave them a way to receive forgiveness and to be restored so that they could stand up on their feet and they could walk again, spiritually speaking. When an Israelite sinned, he would bring his sacrifice to the priest. He would confess his sin, the priest would offer the sacrifice, atonement would be made, and sin would be forgiven. And again, the fulfillment of this typology from the Old Testament in the New Testament, the, uh, the ful fulfilling of that whole thing is in the sacrament, I would say, of confession. Because when we go to confession, we are doing 
um, in the new covenant terms, what the Israelites did in the old covenant. We are bringing our sacrifice to the priest. In this case, our sacrifice is Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, not not some miserable sheep or or goat. We're bringing our sacrifice. We confess our sin, and we offer that sacrifice again to God for our forgiveness. And the priest pronounces us forgiven. We receive forgiveness. And this is crucial and important because as you and I attempt to break with various patterns of idolatry in our lives, we're going to fail. And we're going to fail not once, not twice. We're going to fail many, many times. And in the sacrament of confession, God has given us a beautiful way to be washed and to be set back on our feet so that we can walk again. I always think of confession as being like when Jesus said to people, take up your mat and walk, you know, the paralytic, take up your mat and and walk. And it's it's something psychologically powerful. I mean, I was a product, I, I was an evangelical for 20 years or so, and I know psychologically way more powerful to go to a priest in the confessional and to confess your sin and receive much more powerful than simply looking up and saying, oh God, I did it again. Thanks. Much more psychologically powerful, but also spiritually powerful because, again, this is a sacrament. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and chapter 1, verse 9. In 1 John, we read this, My little children, I am writing to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the expiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And then back to chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This gives us, the the confessional gives us something as concrete as what the Israelites were given in the Old Testament, something to do, something concrete as the channel through which God gives us his forgiveness. So that's step six. I only want to add one thing to this, and that is that if you were to to pull a room of about 30 different kinds of Christians from 30 different churches and say, you know, what must you do to be saved? One person might say, well, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, right? Someone might say, believe and be baptized. Someone might say, repent and be baptized. Someone Mm -hmm. might say, Mm -hmm. you know, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us from, you know, all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And you might get all these different answers about what it is that you have to do. This framework that you've laid out is the only thing that uses all of them <laughs> and contextualizes them and yeah. puts them in like an actual process. <laughs> like, yeah. so I can say to the person yeah. who says, well, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved in your household. I'll be like, yes. And to the person who says, you know, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised from yeah. the dead. I'll say, yes, that too. <laughs> like it puts all these pieces together that so many people have separated out and treated as though they were individual things and pitted them right. against the others. It's it assembles them all into one coherent thing. It's so good, Matt. Yeah, that that's why we talk about this as Catholics as the fullness of the faith in that sense embracing everything that's true about how we become faithful followers of Jesus. Yes, 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 yes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the the only thing the Catholic would say no to in that room is the question for many of them, is that all? That's the only thing we, uh, yeah. is that one <laughs> all? No, it's all. That's not all. These are all. <laughs> it is all of these together that are the answer to the question. Um, and what I the thing that I would add after that high five amen to Matt would be something I've thought about a lot, you know, regarding the sacrament of reconciliation, Ken. I remember making fun of this when I was Pastor Kenny, and I would say, oh, that's easy. You know, it's Friday night, and you go out and sin, yeah. and and the next day you just go to your priest and say you're sorry, and he absolves you. Well, that's easy. Well, now Catholic Kenny would go, well, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. It sounds like you got an easier one, though, Pastor Kenny. All you had to do is look up at the sky and say you were sorry. Um, which one is really the easy way out? Um, and so the, the sacrament of, of reconciliation embraces all of, as you just pointed out, the New Testament material about how we process our sin in community with God sacramentally. It's beautiful. Ding, Good ding, points, ding. you guys. Okay, great <laughs> anyway. points, you guys. Now, 
Now let's move All on right. to step seven. Mm-hmm. Great points. And yeah, this is this does come together like a, a full kind of a picture. Step seven is this. We must remind ourselves constantly that the path of obedience to God's word is the path of freedom and happiness. The Israelites come out of Egypt. They follow the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, the Holy Spirit, into the desert where they begin to be tested and tried. God gives them food from heaven, supernatural manna to eat every day. Remember that? There's so many little details too. The food was there every day for them. Give us this day our daily bread. And then they have their way of of, of reestablishing their relationship with God when they sin. We have confession. And he takes them to Mount Sinai where they are given the Ten Commandments, God's Word. Mount Sinai is where God gives them his commandments, and the commandments are not conceived as something that enslaves. They are never conceived as something that enslaves. They are given and they're conceived as the very path to freedom and happiness. I think about the passage in Deuteronomy where he says, I set before you this day life and death to love me, cling to me, trust me, follow me. All those words, they're all interchangeable, you know, and they all lead toward life. In fact, it's sin that enslaves. It is idolatry that enslaves because idols just get their grip into us. They don't satisfy. They don't do what we want them to do, and yet they capture us. Obedience makes us free. And as you pointed out last week, Kenny, Psalm 1 is still true. I I loved how you did that, and, and I'll let you do it again too if you hear, but you know, Psalm 1 is still true. It, it's still true that the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, whose delight is in the law of the Lord and on God's law, he meditates day and night. It's still true that he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit and its even as leaves do not wither and whatever he does prospers. So that's step seven is to take the word of God, the commandments of Jesus, the new, the Bible, to take the commandments of God, the moral commandments that are given to us and realize this is my path to freedom to treasure those commandments and keep them. Any complaint? No complaint for me other than just to refer back to the uh, episode we just did uh, a little bit ago about all the things that we obey and become enslaved to and become servants of that don't bring us happiness. I mean, think about, you know, how complicated it is just to live as an adult human being in the United States of America and how many forms you have to fill out just to exist. (laughs) <laughs> right yeah and and then what and it, here we are in like the freest country in the world right and yet we have to have insurance for everything you know we have to have everything licensed and registered we have to pay rent or a mortgage one or the other you know we have to do all these things and we're in the freest nation in the free world right i mean it's a it's a, it's a completely different concept of freedom to obey something yeah. higher than yourself voluntarily. I don't have an option of whether or not to pay my mortgage. I have an option of whether or not to follow Christ. And when I do, I find I'm freer. When I don't, I find I'm not. You Here's something you don't have an option to do. You don't have an option to obey something. You know, because again, everybody lives by faith. Everybody's following. Everybody's trusting. Everybody's obeying something. And like Bob Dylan once, you know, wisely said, it may be the devil, it may be the Lord, but you've got to serve somebody. you got to serve somebody. somebody. Yep. And you're going to, you're going to. Okay, now, which means moving forward, we're coming now to step eight, the new step that we're adding and the concluding step of this series, really. The final step is this. Everything that we have said in steps one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, we must persevere in them. We don't just do them today and then not do them tomorrow and stop doing them forever. No, we must persevere in them. You don't pray once. We don't trust and obey once. We don't spend one hour in the desert and then back to Egypt. We don't receive the Eucharist once. We don't go to confession once. We don't read the word of God and obey it once. We persevere until the end in order to enter the promised land. Now, we've talked about this many times in the past in our series on justification in different places, but I think that this, I believe this is a truth 
that any natural reading of the Old and New Testaments will reveal to us. It's just so intuitive. It leaps off virtually every page of the Bible. The warnings are simply everywhere against those who would say, we don't need to persevere to the end. We just need to do it once. You know, I accepted Jesus. I'm, I'm safe. That kind of a thing. In the Old Testament, we hear David crying out in Psalm 51 after having committed adultery with Bathsheba and then murdered her husband, Uriah the Hittite. We hear David pleading with God, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Well, either David believed that that was a possibility or David was wrong. The Holy Spirit couldn't have been taken from him. The implication or the the assumption here, and, and this is throughout the Old Testament. I don't have time to read too many verses, but we can look at Ezekiel chapter 18, Ezekiel 33. There are many other passages. The assumption is that after his great sin, he needed to be forgiven by God. He needed to stand up and walk again in God's ways, and, and God could take his Holy Spirit from him. And now in the New Testament, this is everywhere, gentlemen, and I'm going to look at just a couple of passages. There are so many. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 12. Here's a passage where Paul recounts the story of the Israelites in the desert on their way to the promised land. And he reminds his readers, that is the, the Christians in Corinth and the church in Corinth, he reminds them that even though the Israelites had been baptized into Moses, even though they had their supernatural food and drink, the manna, the water, even though God gave them everything they needed to make their way to the promised land, many of them didn't make it. He says they fell dead in the wilderness. And then here comes the punchline. Now, these things happened, Paul writes, to them as a warning and were written down for our instruction. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Another passage is Colossians 1, verses 21 through 23, where Paul is writing to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. In other words, he's writing to Christians, and he says this, And you who once were estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in the body of his flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided that you continue, provided that you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. And then one more verse, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, that has always been very powerful to me. The author says, See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. For we have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly, if we hold firmly till the end, the confidence we had at first. You know, this whole passage, what it does to me, you guys, is it, just take the emotion of this passage. Why would the author of Hebrews say to anybody, you know, why would I ever say to you, why would I ever encourage the two of you day after day, as long as it is still called today? Why would I encourage you to make sure that you don't allow your, your hearts to be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin? such that you fall away from the living God, if I did not believe that perseverance is part of the teaching of Scripture, that we have to persevere. And mm -hmm. I want to make one practical point before I open the, the gate for you guys, because I love something that Matt said last week, because you read these passages and it can sound ominous. What? I have to persevere? I have to keep on doing this my whole life? But Matt, you made this great um, point last week where you said something like, but when you think of it, there's not, there's my paraphrase. There, there's not really that much we have to do to reach eternal life. I mean, walk with Christ, do what he tells you to do, trust and obey, go to confession when you fall, receive the sacraments. It's not that hard. And, and when you think about it, yeah, I mean, as a Catholic, what I feel like is I just need to pray. I need to struggle. I need to want to walk with the Lord. And when I fall, I need to receive forgiveness. Yeah, you know, go to mass, you know, and 
I don't sit here trembling because it will take an act of the will for me to give myself over to some sin to the point that I, where I allow my, my heart to be hardened to the point to where I fall away from the living God. And I just say, forget that stuff. I don't want to do that anymore. So I, yeah, I, I mean, thought that point you made last week was good. What's, what's, what's the easier path? Go to Mass, go to confession when you fall, get baptized to start that process off. You're having a good day, you're having a bad day, I don't care. You just do what you're supposed to do and uh, buck it up. It's once a week, you can make it through. You'll feel better at some point, you'll feel worse at other points. Do it, the mechanism's yeah. there, follow the routine. What's, easy, what's, what's harder, that or you have to feel close to God or you're not saved. That <laughs> is an impossible head game that you are yeah, never right. going to going to get. Uh, but the, the other thing I was going to say here, you know, going back to that idea of how what you've just said from our fall to God's call to turning from idols to, to you know, receiving the sacraments to, to <laughs> persevering in faith. Originally, when we were talking about and brainstorming this series, I thought we were going to be talking about, you know, a seven-part series refuting Calvinism. And in some ways, there have been elements of that. Uh, that's not what this series has been, though. Um, but I was just thinking about John chapter 15 and how you, from a Reformed Calvinist perspective, and Kenny and I coming from a Wesleyan Arminian perspective, I don't know if you and we would get into this argument before, but I've been in an argument before from an Arminian perspective talking to a Calvinist where we would both be using John 15 to make our argument. And it'd go something like this. So like my Calvinist friend would say to me, uh, John 15, verse 16, you did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last as a way of saying, listen, this is all God's action. It's not our action. God chose us from the foundation of the world, right? He predestined us. And therefore, whoever is saved is always saved. And we have to have confidence in that. We will bear fruit as proof of that. And I would argue back. A few verses earlier where Jesus says, uh, remain in me and I'll remain in you. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is, uh, you know, thrown away and withers. The branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned, right? We would be using this same discourse from Jesus and splitting it into pieces and pitting them against one another. Whereas what you've just done in assembling this is said, God found us. God chose us. He called us. We respond and we must remain. It synthesizes the first half of Jesus, what Jesus is saying in John 15 with the last half of Je what Jesus is saying in John 15 in this same discourse about the vine and branches. It's all meant to be of one piece. And so many of the theological rabbit trails we've gone down and so many denominations get into wars over words because they want to take one piece of this and isolate it out. Um, and that you know treacherous word that was introduced in the Reformation and added to so many of these concepts— alone right um when it's not meant to be alone these are not meant to be isolated concepts of course we've got to persevere it's as plain as the nose on your face if there's anything <laughs> scripture is clear about it is that you have to stay on target red leader yes. that's all i've got to say yes. about that i i take my catholic word and and i smash your word alone <laughs> there you go <laughs> Okay, I have two f f final final thoughts, Ken and Matt. Uh, one is a scripture, and one is a thought from the Catechism, because I know I know we're coming in for a landing. And again, quoting the author of Hebrews, he says uh, in chapter two, "Therefore, we must pay greater attention to that which we have heard, so that we do not drift away from it. For if the message declared through angels was valid, and every transgression or disobedience." received a just penalty, verse 3, how can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? So there's that concept of, of perseverance. We have to stay in it. And in the whole discourse of faith in the, in the catechism, when it, where it, it, it talks about faith, where the catechism discusses what faith is and the elements of faith, there's a paragraph 162. It's titled Perseverance in Faith. And this will be my last contribution to the discussion. Paragraph 162 says, Faith is an entirely free gift that God makes to man. We can lose this priceless gift, as St. Paul indicated to St. Timothy, quote, 
wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting conscience, certain persons have made shipwreck of their faith, close quote. To live, grow, and persevere in the faith until the end, we must nourish it with the word of God. We must beg the Lord to increase our faith. It must be, quote, working through charity, abounding in hope, and rooted in the faith of the church. And that's the catechism exhorting us, as you have, Ken, to persevere in the faith. Okay, and one final word of encouragement, I guess, for me at the end is I think about a passage from Deuteronomy where God said to the children of Israel, this commandment that I give you this day is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. It's not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us to bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? This word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart, so that you can do it. Amen. Mm. Amen. That's the end of this series, guys. We're going to start something else next week. Yeah, I give you a uh, Pentecostal hanky wave. which you means And it amen. should be probably Everything. a couple of weeks before we start a new thing, because um, we're still kind of concepting out and fleshing it, but uh, there will be much more to go. I, I only have to issue one mm -hmm. correction. I mentioned stay on target, red leader. It's actually Gold 5 who says <laughs> stay on target in the Death Star Trench run. But, you know, I didn't have my notes in front of me and I was shooting from the hip. That's not, by the way, how you land the plane. That's all I'm going to say about that. It sounds, but it, I hope that you've it, <laughs> enjoyed, enjoyed this series. It, it seems so sad that I just read Deuteronomy where, 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 you know, the word of God is near you in your heart so that you can do it. And, and yet that the last idea that people should go away with this gold, <laughs> gold star or whatever <laughs> It seems Star. sad. It's called five. <laughs> hey, see, he, he's a hero. He stayed the course. Oh, okay. He made That's it possible. Right. <laughs> At any rate. <laughs> okay, guys. So with that, that wraps what up our series thing. on turning from idols to serve the living God, how to become holy, you know, whatever it is that you uh, want to call Very this boy. series that brings you comfort. Go back and watch the other episodes in the series uh, that really build this case and uh, kind of isolate the points out and really dive deep on each of the individual points. Um, go to chnetwork.org to find those. Uh, you can also join our online community. We even have like weekly fellowship meetings um, where we have sort of Zoom discussions with people uh, to talk about where they are, what part of the desert they're stuck in, uh, for example. So go to community.chnetwork.org for that. And as I mentioned before, if you go to chnetwork.org slash compass and become uh, a monthly donor of any kind to help our work and to be able to help us help others, um, when you're checking out, making your donation, enter the code OTJ3141 at checkout, and we'll send you a copy of Marcus Grody's book, What Must I Do to Be Saved, which covers what we covered in, was it like 25 hours? Uh, Marcus does it in less than 100 pages, <laughs> if you want like a really <laughs> distilled idea of this. <laughs> you were saying, Ken. I was, was going to say that I think the book is totally different than what we've done here, but maybe it's not. Not entirely different. Not entirely different. Oh. You should see... Ken, what you need to do is you need to go to chnetwork.org slash compass, enter the code OTJ3141 at checkout, and I'll send you a copy, and you can see. A signed but copy, I have to, an autograph signed copy. copy. There you but go. But I'll have to donate. There you go. So, I mean, you could just have them take, take it out of your paycheck. Okay, let's go. Let's go. All right, this well, thank you for watching this episode. series of of on the journey uh we've got another episode uh another series of episodes coming up soon we're very excited about that i don't want to spoil it but let's just say it's in the lab it's in the works and it's gonna be a lot of fun i'm matt swaim ken hensley kenny Burchard. thank you again as always talk to you next time around see you guys this has been inscrutable <laughs>